Well, um, hi guys, thanks for joining us. Good evening, thank you all for coming. We're really excited to bring you Author Hub. Uh, basically, Author Hub is a, a free interactive orthopedic education for all. So Pete and I run this uh, online master's in orthopedic trauma, and we do these weekly online tutorials where we generally mess around and do a little bit of teaching on the side, and it gave us the idea for the podcast and then this. So Author Hub started out basically a fortnight ago as a, Pete, Mike, and I were chatting as a way to provide our local trainees with some remote teaching because of COVID-19 and it's quickly exploded into this. It's amazing, so thank you for coming. We're at um, www.authorhub.xyz. I insist on pronouncing it with a Z and it's very much a work in progress and we're developing content for the site all the time. So please do check in regularly. This uh, site is where we host the C1 Do One podcast. There's gonna be regular case discussions to basically test and challenge you and us. And, we're gonna, and we aim to run regular live interactive webinars um, starting now. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to set the scene for tonight's webinar. As a community, we've become very accustomed to three things lately. One is a major change to the way that we work and practice. Uh, another is photographs of this gentleman. And the final one is a major information overload uh, with new official guidance about PPE, clinical management, COVID-19, etc, etc, often multiple times a day. So the purpose of tonight's webinar is to try and make some sense of all the noise, make things just a little clearer for you. Quite clear reading all the literature about COVID-19. If ever you wanted to publish papers with low numbers and lack of control groups and poor methodology, now is your time. Send them in, chuck them in. <laughs> We've got guidance from everywhere, such as NHS England, um, who are basically talking about choosing non-operative treatment if it's not clear cut whether something needs surgery or not. Um, and this boast, which um, Alex is in a better position to speak to, supports reasoned, pragmatic decision making in these extraordinary circumstances. Um, it acknowledges that non-operative management of many injuries is appropriate, and that fact that re reduced face-to-face -face follow up is also going to be needed. As a result of this, um, Charlie's book has uh, gone viral again. So if you didn't have the foresight uh, like me here to order it 12 years ago, um, I mean, it was going for £887, but fortunately the publisher um, has now made it available for free. So you can just go to Cambridge University Press and download it. So during the upcoming talks, I want you all to keep two following scenarios in mind. One is the fracture that you reduced well and you plan to treat definitively non-op. This is the fracture that with a somewhat light touch, uh, you can be reasonably confident that it should be fine. And the other scenario is the fracture that you wanted to fix. So you accepted the first reduction in plaster or the, or the less than perfect external fixator because you plan to go to theatre to treat it definitively anyway. But you couldn't open fractures came in that trumped it or the patient was COVID positive and wasn't fit for anaesthetic during the operative window or the patient DNA or you couldn't get hold of them. So for a variety of reasons, you couldn't treat the patient as you'd planned. And so it went down this alternate pathway, which is this uh, inadvertently neglected fracture. Uh, Pete's going to touch on that more at the end, but for this pink box, just to say, if you're expecting any delay to your definitive treatment, do try and preempt it with a good temporizing intervention. So we've got three um, outstanding speakers with us today, um, and I am slightly nervous because I can't be sure they're all wearing pants. Um, we're very fortunate to have Alex Trompter. Alex is an orthopedic trauma surgeon at George's, uh, honorary read in orthopedic surgery in the TPD down there, and on the OTS committee. Um, Alex also got the medal for the exam that, during my sitting, so I'm still slightly bitter about that. Um, just glad I passed. And then we've got our very own Pete Bates, who's our orthopedic, orthopedic trauma surgeon. He's our clinical director, and so he's our dear leader. Uh, and first up is my colleague here at Bart's, Livio Dimascio. Livio is an upper, experienced upper limb surgeon. So uh, I found this quite a difficult talk to sort of write because um, it's not particularly sexy um, and trying to find treatment for upper limb um, problems uh, that are non-operative. Uh, perhaps you can treat an awful lot of things uh, in upper limb surgery non-operatively by neglecting them and largely because we don't walk on our upper limbs. Um, this is essentially biological warfare and this came at the weekend from uh, John Hopkins University dashboard. And I just looked at this and it sort of looked like something from war games. So there is almost 2 million cases worldwide. And it looks like there is various shells that have been dropped around globally. So the problem that we're faced with is the rationing of resources. And usually in warfare, 
I would think rationing of resources largely is access to surgery because of surgeons. But this has sort of completely turned it on its head that um, the actual thing that we're rationing is anaesthetists' access to anaesthetic machines because they're getting used to keep people alive and PPE. And, and largely there is uh, a risk also, not only to patients that we're treating, but also to staff. So Cash touched on, on this and these, these are really small numbers, but this does suggest that actually treatment of orthopedic patients in itself isn't without risk and a mortality rate of 20% is something that you actually have to bear in mind in potentially fit and well individuals. So what is non-active management? Um, well, um, it is often the standard of care in upper limb injuries. Um, so we've got to bear that in mind. So every time there is a non-operative treatment, what we need to do is actually try and streamline that so that we try and reduce the need for a potentially unnecessary uh, x-rays. We're all guilty of sending people to check x-rays in clinics and people coming to more clinic appointments perhaps than they really need to. Uh, we've got to think about plaster changes. When are they necessary? When are they not necessary? Because this all increases footfall and it compromises, uh, you know, we've got to think we don't want to uh, compromise outcome. Um, but also, to a degree, many of these treatments may delay the inevitable secondary treatment. So it may be that our treatment is acceptable and we see what happens and then we deal with the, the, the consequence of this in the future as long as there is not significant irreversible disability. So uh, casting is a bit of a lost art. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're all guilty of perhaps not being quite as good as our, our previous orthopedic uh, surgeons that taught us were. Um, but plasters definitely sometimes can cause more harm than good. And in the upper limb, you can put uh, a child into an elbow cast for you know, six weeks and they have no issues whatsoever. But if you immobilize an elbow, for example, or you immobilize the fingers as in this cast as well, then people are gonna get very, very stiff. So um, there are risks and we need to weigh up those risks of poor outcomes and risk to the patient, but also cost to the individual and society. So this is from the guidance from the Royal College. These are pretty straightforward things, but the, but the, the, the question that we need to ask is which fractures are we going to be trying to treat in a non-emergency uh, non setting, but before they actually heal with non-operative measures. So they've suggested intra-articular displaced fractures, periprostatic fractures. Funnily, they actually mentioned electron fractures, which actually wouldn't have been top of my list of upper limb uh, operations that needed to be done, okay? So we want to minimize um, risk to individual patients and to um, the people in hospital, our anesthetic colleagues, the scrub nurses, the surgeons, the, the, the ODAs, by thinking about regional anesthesia if possible, and uh, perhaps using Wallant techniques, which is something that was coined by Donald Lalonde probably six years ago now, um, really the, the impetus was that uh, in North America they didn't necessarily have access to a, sort of a, an all singing and all dancing operating theatre with an anaesthetist and therefore by doing minor op surgery under local anaesthetic and local um, and uh, adrenaline and without a tourniquet you could actually do a significant amount of hand surgery um, and actually people are pushing the envelope to the point where you know you often see on YouTube or LinkedIn that somebody's fixed the clavicle fracture uh, using Wallant techniques. Um, so uh, there are an awful lot of fractures. I'm not going to go on all of them, but uh, go on about all of them, but um, I will try and touch upon some that are reasonably interesting. So clavicle fractures, I think most, you know, if not all clavicle fractures, unless it's sticking out your skin, gets non-operative treatment in the current uh, current uh, uh, situation that we find ourselves in. Um, the vast majority will go on to unite if you're a politician, but there are you know, a minority that will go on to have symptomatic non-union, but this is not a life-threatening problem and it can be dealt with in the future. I must say, since uh, we started treating clavicle fractures, then I do far less um, operations uh, for non-union but this is something that potentially we can deal with in the future. There are some lateral clavicle fractures 
that I would consider offering surgery for. And these are the sort of near tier 2A or um, these are the lateral clavicle fractures just medial to the coronoid tubercle. Uh, the coronoid tubercle has uh, the CC ligament attachment. And if you've got displacement of 100%, these all tend to go on to non-union. So, so there is a discussion to be had with the patient, but um, every case that we perform should go through an MDT. So proximal humeral fractures, there are all sorts. Um, and again, the vast majority of proximal humeral fractures get treated non-operatively. Now, the three pictures I've put up are actually near type two proximal humerus fractures, but they are sort of uh, apples and oranges. They're very different. So the one on the left of the screen will do extremely well, although it's uh, slightly high energy, um, it will go on to unite more often than not. It's not in varus and that generally they will do extremely well. And that's something that we did find from the first proffer study, that the outcomes were pretty good. Grace tuberosity fractures are a mixed bag. If they're displaced, they can cause a lot of disability. So that's something that we'll discuss. And obviously a, a anatomical neck and definitely a dislocated anatomical neck is not gonna do very well without surgery. So proximal humerus fractures, all sorts. But largely all these fractures can be treated non-operatively. Um, and it's largely dependent on what the age of the patient and the pre-morbid -morb functional status is. So even a very displaced, comminuted, uh, perhaps not a dislocated proximal humerus fracture, but there isn't an awful lot of evidence to say leaving a dislocated proximal humerus fracture in an elderly individual does any worse, assuming they don't have a neurovascular compromise. But um, you need to describe. You need to think. Well, who's going to do? Who's actually going to benefit from this surgery? And there is a whole bunch of people that are low demand that actually will be reasonably happy or very happy often with, with the worst looking x-rays you've ever seen. A greater tuberosity fracture displacement, really, this is something that we need to be hot on because this is the thing that all generally proximal humerus fractures go on to heal. But if it's very displaced, it will, go, uh, it will create a lot of uh, disability with poor function. So um, what can we do about these fractures? without surgery. So the, the standard of care really is internal rotation braces. Now th there's a, a growing body of work and in fact um, a colleague of mine at uh, the Homerton, uh, Toby Baring, is uh, getting uh, some funding I hope to actually look at this. But um, Pascal Boileau pointed out that actually putting people in external rotation significantly improves the alignment of a surgical neck fracture. And actually there is some evidence that suggests that actually if you immobilize people in this position, their initial uh, um, gain of motion is far better than if you fix them internal rotation because there isn't the shortening of the anterior capsule. Um, there is a group in uh, Japan that have also looked at this suggesting that you can extend this to uh, three part fractures where the greater tuberosity is displaced and external rotation can improve the position of that. So if you see somebody in clinic who's got a proximal humerus fracture and you're thinking, well, does it, does it not need uh, treatment surgically? Then it would be worthwhile thinking, well, let's put them into an external rotation splint in clinic and re-X-ray them and see actually whether the position has been improved. Greater tuberosity fractures. Well, I've drawn here a sort of axial uh, image and the greater tuberosity quite often involves uh, infraspinatus as well as sub, uh, supraspinatus. And therefore the displacement moment is gonna be external. So again, if you externally rotate them in a brace and re-X-ray them, then potentially you will get a better position that you might be happier um, to, to run with and it may well heal in, a, in an adequate position to give them good function. But if you do have this type of fracture and you are gonna treat it in a brace, I would suggest you need to bring it back at one and two weeks to make sure it isn't moving. If it, if it moves even a little bit and you think, well, it's still acceptable, if it's on the move, it's gonna move more and therefore I'd fix it because um, movement suggests that you might be sitting with egg on your face at six weeks with this sort of picture. And this is a disaster because this is very difficult to actually improve function on, even with reconstruction anatomically. They don't do particularly well. This is sort of like doing uh, a, a repositioning osteotomy of the tuberosity and, and functionally they don't do great.
So that leads quite nicely into rotator cuff tears. Rotator cuff tears, um, most of them we can uh, actually ignore until most of this uh, COVID crisis is over. But the one uh, cuff tear that is necessary to fix is a traumatic complete tendon tear. And they tend to retract. So if it's in full thickness, it involves the entire width of supraspinatus and definitely if it's supraspinatus and infraspinatus, this is not something that I'd wait for four or five or six months to fix because the outcome will be far worse and potentially could become ir um, irreparable. I don't think there's much discussion. Diaphyseal fractures, largely you treat them in the functional brace. If you put two ends of a humerus in the same room, they'll go on to unite in most instances. Um, distal humeral fractures. Um, I think of all the upper limb fractures that you need to treat operatively, this is probably going to be one of the, the top of the list in, 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 in an individual that is reasonably high demand because your elbow needs a, quite a lot, enjoys quite a large range of motion and you need that range of motion to actually feed yourself and do simple tasks like toileting and you need supination as well. So that flexion is hugely important. And you get a whole bunch of miserable patients if they've got elbows that don't move. They're unable to feed themselves and they, you, know, you need to give them rather long cutlery to actually allow them to feed themselves. So what do we do when we're faced with that situation with this? Well, we need to decide, well, we need to be aggressive and fix them early and fix it stably so that we can get the elbow moving. Or if they are of uh, sort of slightly lower demand, and definitely I would, you know, although numbers are not absolute, but let's say choose a number 70 years old, particularly in the current climate of being high risk in the COVID crisis, then I would immobilize them uh, for a couple of weeks just to allow the pain to settle and then take the plaster off and get them to mobilize. And, you know, historically we called this a bag of bones treatment. And surprisingly, I have done it a couple of times over uh, the last sort of uh, few years, and you'd be surprised how happy the patients are. They have movement, they have a bit of pain, they can't load their elbow. But worst case scenario, as long as they've got that movement there, if they have pain in the future, then it's not, uh, you know, uh, it's not an impossibility to do an arthroplasty for them. Um, Electronon fractures, um, intra-articular fractures in young people, I think it's valuable to actually restore their extensor mechanism. But again, it's been demonstrated many times actually in the elderly population, low demand, they do fantastically well and the actual uh, complication rate, regardless of risk of anesthesia, is far, far lower with uh, non-operative treatment. This was an interesting one, capitellum fracture. Um, so if you've got a, a type one capitellum fracture, it is actually possible to treat it non-surgically. And um, if usually you would anaesthetize the patient, but in the absence of access to anesthesia, if you're able to give them good sedation in your fracture clinic, um, and a colleague of mine tells me that Penthrox is a pretty awesome uh, stuff to inhale and you get the patient completely sort of knocked out for a few minutes, you might be, it might be possible with a bit of extension of the elbow to milk the capitellum sort of over the top, uh, underneath brachialis, and then flex the elbow up. And if you get a check x-ray, then you may well be surprised that you've actually got the capitellum reduced underneath the radial head. And if you've able, been able to achieve that, um, good outcomes have been reported by placing them in a plaster for four weeks and then mobilizing them. So, so that, I thought that was quite an interesting way to treat it. Elbow dislocations. Um, well, simple elbow dislocations, I think we'll all agree that you know, the vast, you know, if not all of them, uh, almost all of them, you can, uh, you know, the treatment of choice is reduce, immobilize for a short period, maybe one week at most, and then uh, mobilize and then show them exercises to activate brachialis and triceps. And that will actually keep the elbow reduced because it is a very congruent joint. But a terrible triad where the columns are disrupted, the, cap, um, the, the radial head and the coronoid, they tend to do very poorly because there's no inherent bony stability. But there is this sort of gray area in between where you might have what you know you could describe as a, a terrible triad light where they've had a dislocation, they have got a coronoid fracture, they have got a radial head fracture, but they're pretty undisplaced. Now, in the current climate, I'd say, well, actually, you can often get away with treating this non-operatively if you watch it like a hawk and give them very, very good rehab advice. 
So what I would do is perhaps immobilize them for a week, bring them back, get a check x-ray um, and possibly a CT to quantify the coronoid fracture to make sure that it doesn't involve the medial facet. And if it takes up less than about 30 to 40% of the coronoid and not the facet and the radial head is still spherical on the axial and doesn't involve 30% and isn't displaced and the only humeral joint is congruent, then if you ask the patient to do their rehab supine um, and then activate brachialis and triceps so that the gravity is assisting the only humeral joint and keeping it congruent and they in this position, they do supination, pronation activity, and they do flexion and extension. And then you bring them back weekly for x-rays. Then you may actually avoid surgery. And I've done this a number of times for various people that have been really unkeen on aggressive treatment with fractures. So forearm, uh, forearm fractures. Um, so this is, you know, I would hope that we all sort of learned this as... Um, orthopedic SHJs, three points uh, fixation or plastering. I was always told that if you want a straight bone, you've got to make the past to look like a banana. And this is going back to the, the concept that this is sort of a, a lost art because there's an awful lot of plasters that we see in our coming out of our plaster room that look very tubular. And um, if we're going to treat things non-optively, then perhaps treating them in our fracture clinic with, with um, a synthetic cast is not the best treatment and it may be worth actually getting if you've got a fracture a distal radius fracture that you actually really want to see if you can treat it non-optively then it may be worth actually using plaster of paris rather than a uh, synthetic cast because you're going to be able to mold it a bit better so single bone forearm fractures nightstick fractures although the evidence base is that uh, there are few, fewer non-unions and complications with surgery the non it is sort of equivocal and therefore actually in the current climate a night stick fracture should be treated non-operatively so four weeks and above elbow plaster in neutral and then a, a sort of a forearm sarmiento that prevents forearm rotation but obviously that is only if the radial head is not dislocated sort of similar with a uh, radius fracture if it is a a, a very uh, minimally displaced radius fracture and you think it is not a galeazzi injury um, then it is uh, not inconceivable to treat it in years gone by uh, plaster cast. However, it is an above elbow cast and you need to fix it in supination because biceps will actually supinate the proximal fragments. But uh, Galeazzi did describe this as the, the fracture of necessity and really uh, the outcomes are generally pretty poor if you try and treat them in a plaster. So it's not impossible but you do need to above elbow and supinate to control the, the rotational malalignment that exists in the radius. And it's a fracture of necessity because it necessitates an operation most often. So lastly, distal radius fractures. Um, there again, there's a whole host of them. And um, the, the, the AO classification is quite useful because actually if you split them into A's, B's and C's, the C's are more likely to require an operation and the A's you can usually get away without surgery if you treat them with good casting um, and accept a degree of, you know, ulnar variance problems and a bit of deformity. And the B's, are, they're a bit a half and half. So, so uh, if you're going to put them in a plaster, it's obviously uh, yeah, a prerequisite that you don't go across the metacarpophalangeal joint uh, so that they don't get finger stiffness. But um, a lot of the time you get, a dist you know, this was from my fracture clinic this week. This was a distal radius fracture that rocks up in, in a plaster. And, uh, you know, I, I vetted the clinic and I said, well, this is one person I do want to bring to clinic. So I brought her in, I cut off a plaster and put her in a Futura splint and said, hey, ho, you're going to be absolutely fine. You never need to see us again. This is going to heal up. And you give them good advice. And then that significantly improves footfall in the hospital. So um, the, the distal radius fractures are the dorsal bending fractures that are really the ones that uh, Draft was talking about. Yeah, you can go to uh, the lengths of putting people in finger traps in the fracture clinic, get the image intense fire down to fracture clinic. That might be really helpful. I think plaster of Paris would be really helpful to actually get a good mold. But largely speaking, there is this sort of area of red, which is the clock, 
that dorsal comminution doesn't hold length very well. So we, you know, actually lots of studies have shown that when the, the, the clot resorbs, they're over a period of time, this is an example, uh, elderly lady who comes in with this type of distal radius fracture and it gets very nicely reduced um, and put into a plaster and you accept that and you bring it back to clinic a couple of times and it's sort of acceptable but it moves a bit and lo and behold by eight weeks it is back in the same position where it started. Now I don't think this is actually a disaster because what you need to do at the beginning is decide on the patient do they really need you know are they going to accept that first x-ray position functionally and there is a whole load of people that will very happily accept a degree of deformity so i'm not saying you have to be 100 years old but functionally your your distal radius is this very very same lady now actually she's never injured her left wrist and this is her right wrist and she thought both wrists were exactly the same so um it, to a degree this is why a lot of lower limb surgeons think that upper limb surgeons are very fickle or oh, this is a good operation or oh, no this one doesn't oh, I should do this it's because the same treatment doesn't fit every single bloody patient and there's this old thing where actually there is a great value in speaking to the patient and examining them and finding out what their demands are going to be um, so other distal radius fractures well the, the volar sort of Barton fracture the dorsal uh, uh, Barton fractions, they, they need surgery because they are essentially fracture dislocations and you're not going to control that very well with a plaster. And likewise, if you've got these types of fractures, you need to look at the resources that are available to you. You need to have a discussion with the patient and say, well, look, this is what we can offer you. There is a chance that we, you know, that we may do the surgery for you. You may have some problems. Um, from the surgery, but you may have significant problems if you don't. But largely this is wartime and each day the resources that we have at the Royal London with regards to fracture clinic and sorry, trauma list access is quite variable. So you need to have that discussion. So non-operative treatment is feasible. I haven't spoken about hand surgery. Um, if you go to the, uh, the hand, British uh, Society of uh, Hand Surgeons website um there was a nice uh, uh webinar that was done by um uh, gray giddens that talked about non-octave treatment of hand surgery and he's a real advocate for non-octave management the best of times so if you do want to learn about some non-octave management in hands that would be really valuable um but interventions have to be balanced okay so i i think i finished up there were lots of questions so we'll look at those questions um q a so i've got a couple of questions here i'd like Livio, the panel to address the use of full complete plasters in the acute setting um so in the acute setting you can put a complete plaster on but you need to split it I was always told that if I was operating on a patient and I was putting a complete plaster on, I would cut a strip out of that plaster. And again, this is where the use of plaster of Paris is actually more useful um, than a synthetic cast because uh, synthetic casts are actually quite difficult to get a good mold on. So if you've really got a patient that you want to treat um, in, in a complete cast and put a mold on, then do, do split it. Um, next question, in regards the proximal humerus, how long do we keep them in the ER brace? Um, <clears throat> it's very much the same as if you were to treat them in a, um, a standard broad arm sling. I would say four weeks. The patients don't particularly like it, but truth be told, all patients are miserable with proximal humerus fractures. Uh, they find it really difficult to sleep at night. They prop themselves up. They quite often don't get to their own bed uh, for the first, you know, two to four weeks. So four weeks external rotation splint, and then I would actually mobilize them and actually no, no brace, no splint after that. Um, next question. Current situations had calls from consultants telling not to bring patients back for follow-ups. If we, uh, decide for non-op and see them again at six weeks to remove plaster, um, what are your thoughts of bringing back patients for more frequent? Well, 
I think you need to vet your clinics. I think there are an awful lot of patients that come to Fracture Clinic that don't need to come. And if you actually are able to vet your clinic in advance, and I'm sure all of you book x-rays in advance, um, this is something that you can decide who needs to come and who doesn't. I think there is real value. If you're going to treat somebody non-operatively and you're going to treat them well non-operatively, that does increase footfall and you are going to need to attend for a plaster change unless you're going to accept a poor, you know, if you accept that the patient's going to have, a, you know, a, a less than graceful position of their distal radius fracture because they're low function and 70 years old, then absolutely you don't need to bring them back. Um, you know, look at that first x-ray, a distal radius, excellent example. Look at that first x-ray of displacement. Say, well, although I've reduced it by pulling it, it's in a better position. What is it going to look like in eight weeks? So it's very likely to look like the first one, despite your amazing molding, etc. So if they're low demand and they're 75 years old, they're probably best off not coming back until you cut the plaster off. Um, Displaced proximal pole scaphoids, um, wait for non-union or treat. Oh. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I think in the current climate, you would have the conversation, tell them not to smoke and you would wait for that non-union and you would treat it at a later date. Um, much the same as uh, waist fractures, um, you know, unless it's unstable, associated with the perilunate, um, then, uh, probably non-operative treatment. Uh, bear in mind that scaphoid tubercle fractures do not need to go into a plaster. They can go into a future splint. Okay, I think we're done. Is that right? Yeah, you are. Thank me. you very much, Olivia. That's Enough awesome. <laughs> you, <All right. laughs> dismissed. Thank you. Thanks, mate. That was great. Um, uh, Pete, you're up. Try not to take one hour. I, how long was I? You are fine. It's Pete I'm worried about. He had, Pete is a habitual line stepper. He has no regard for concepts of time. Um, Pete, if you could, un, if you could, uh, he's got a pop pub at his place. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, guys? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so I'm doing pelvis and femur, uh, which kind of feels like the easy, the easy uh, gig here because most of this is high energy and the high energy stuff is you know, the more high energy you go the, the less and less becoming it comes to non-opter treatment um uh, this is my uh this is my remit here femur pelvis and acetabulum but just before we go there i'm, I'm gonna do a little intro similar to what what lydia did earlier on um uh, just talking about um the drivers for non-op we live in a weird world don't we uh with with uh, for non-opter treatment because uh uh, we, we, we've become so used to treating things operatively. We, we fix almost everything. Anything that's displaced, we generally fix. And so uh, it's almost become, there needs to be a good reason not to do an operation rather than uh, I've got to fix this because. That's kind of what orthopedic life has turned into. Um, whoa. There are some drivers for non-operative treatment. One is there's no evidence for surgery. And of course, that, that's definitely a thing. Uh, uh, it's never really stopped us, though, has it? <laughs> it's never really stopped us doing the operations. Uh, um, and uh, obviously, there could be equivocal benefits. But we're still, you know, we often end up doing, doing surgeries. We're not absolutely certain that uh, 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 doing the patient any good in, in, in good times. There are also patient facts, of course, not well, not consenting, not compliant, etc. But there's always that pushback. The drivers for non-op are pushing down. But there's always that fear that we have, that innate fear that patients will have a poor outcome if we don't operate. That like that pushback of like, yeah, but if we don't, well, what was going to happen? I'm going to have to do an osteotomy laid down. That, oh, they're going to have DRUJ tenders. Oh, they're going to have a, a wonky pelvis, whatever it is. And that red line I've drawn there is that's like the trauma meeting isn't it that is the the threshold the boundary where the trauma trauma dis discussion the trauma meeting happens it's all that discussion around pros and cons of surgery etc the thing that's changed in covid is we now have a limitation on our resources to kind of throw in which is an additional downward driver for non-op operating room access they're, they're all listed there interestingly as livia was saying actually 
it's the it's the access to theatres, which is the which is the main thing that certainly we we've noticed in our our, our uh, hospital. PPE equipment isn't really it hasn't been a massive uh, deal breaker, and nor has hospital capacity. I mean, PPE is a bit short, but uh, it's not it not not in theatres. Uh, it doesn't stop people getting operations, and similar. Hospital capacity has gone mad, hasn't it? Uh, you know, I was, I was hearing somebody else's hospital's got 500 empty beds at the moment. You know, we've shut down all elective activity and traumas right down. So, uh, actually, it's it's more about anaesthetics being being limiting. But always, whenever you've got like a, a, a fracture, you're always worried that if you have a poor outcome, you're going to have a difficult reconstruction, and that's sometimes what drives your decision to operate. Um, and the truth is, though, that for high energy injuries, um, uh, for hot, uh, so I'm just there. So I was just answering the question. For high energy injuries, um, they are very rarely non operative uh, cases. And the femur is a great example of that. And I'm, uh, I'm using the femur as. Uh, I'm obviously excluding great tuberosity fractures and like lesser tuberosity avulsions and stuff. But if you think about the proximal femur, where's the, where's the debate? Where's the controversy, if you like? It's around implant choice, isn't it? You know, if it's extra caps, do you make a DHS or a plate? Uh, if it's intra caps, do we use a hemi or do we use a total? Is it cemented, uncemented, etc.? Distal femur, similar. It's all about implant choice, isn't it? It's not about whether we fix or not. It's what you fix it with. Uh, and a uh, similar scenario, slightly, uh, slightly nuanced in the shaft, is my, where it's getting a nail, the question is whether you poke it in from the top or poke it in from the bottom, so to speak. Um, because the fact of the matter is, the femur fractures don't really lend themselves to non-operative treatment. This is a bad situation, uh, as is this. It's not unsalvageable, but they're just not great situations to be in. Uh, and and uh, for the patient to end up in this way, uh, They've spent an awful long time in a very uncomfortable plaster, and yet still they need uh, still they need uh, uh, fixation. Uh, people talk about lost arts, don't they? Lost art of traction, of balanced traction, and a lot has talked about this. Um, but the fact of the matter is, this is a bit of a shit treatment as a definitive treatment. Hold that thought. As a definitive treatment for the femur fractures, this is a bit rubbish. You know, I want you to imagine that you have been involved in a car accident and you have uh, a big injury and you wake up in hospital and you've been moved into the 1970s and you're lying in bed and you sit up and you look around you and this is what you see. And I would put it to you that you would have a very similar expression to this young girl. You'd be sitting there and you'd be thinking, what the fuck? Because it's not a great treatment of femur fractures. And actually in the femur, it's much more about effective temporizing rather than non-operative treatment, if you see what I mean. What I mean is people may, they're gonna get that femoral nail, but it might take us two or three days to get there. So what do we do in the meantime? And that is things like good analgesia, fascia iliaca blocks if need be, um, effective traction. So often you'll see this kind of thing where you have a patient just lying there with like a, a piece of string pulling its their, their, their traction pin or off their traction and their, and their foot's jammed against the end of the bed. And there really is no surveillance to this patient in terms of their traction because we're not very used to it. And so that takes back to the, my previous diagram of actually, if you are, if a patient is gonna have to wait four or five days to have their surgery, uh, Actually, we should be thinking not just about blocks and analgesia, but how we can set up an effective traction uh, situation. Attention to pressure areas. And of course, the thing that we always forget, patient information, letting them know, telling them when, when the airport operation is going to be, not telling them, oh, we're going to keep you starved all day, and then you're not going to get your operation. And we'll do the same tomorrow and the next day. Patient information, that's what drives patients crazy, is when they don't know what's going on. So that's femur. Pelvis. Well, I've given you a uh, like a genetics is the the uh, uh, um, you know this is bog standard classification of of, um, of uh, young and Burgess. The words escape me. Classification, but this works for AO classification, whatever you like. There, are, it, it it splits into two flavors, doesn't it? On the left, the type ones, you've got the uh, the low energy ones, and on the right, you've got the type the type twos and threes, which are more high energy. This is how I conceptually think of low versus high energy pelvic fractures. 
we are bony creatures, right? We think about bones, but what we forget about is in the pelvis, at least, you see the pelvic x-ray and you think bones, bones, bones. But what you forget about is that the bones are all wrapped up in these unbelievably tight and powerful ligaments. So if you have a low energy fracture, you get hit by the hit by a car, let's say 20 miles per hour, you can crack your pelvis good and proper, but it doesn't necessarily become unstable because if you don't disrupt the ligamentous uh, structures, you don't rip open an SI joint, you don't damage your pelvic floor, then actually the pelvis, the, the ligaments are so strong that even though you've broken your pelvis in two places, you can still walk on it because the pelvis, the, the ligaments hold it strong. So in the low energy setting, absolutely non-operative treatment all the way. And, and there is a, a nuanced argument about, well, whether LC1s may be a bit more comfortable and mobilize a bit quicker if you treat them. But in, in this, you know, in a constrained environment, type ones, stable pelvic injuries, in other ones, otherwise ones that are not gonna move because they're held by the ligaments, non-op, no doubt about it. And that's pretty much the story. Because the rest, the twos and threes, uh, unless they're completely undisplaced and their cracks are high energy injuries. And they, th it's not just the bone that's broken, the ligamentous structures as well have gone in most of these cases. And so uh, these, these are fractures that are potentially on the move. You can't treat an AP compression non-operatively. What about a binder? Can you stick them in a binder and just like leave them in that for six weeks? You can, but, uh, but uh, you, you can't take a shit in a binder. You'd have to give them a colostomy. <laughs> And uh, what about an X fix? You're thinking. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, a proper orif and a plate and all of that would be would be uh, would be uh, would would take a long time. But an X fix be really quick, wouldn't it? Answer: Yes, it would. But and so this is the 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 argument about what are the what are the austere circumstances in which we're in at the moment? It's access to theatre. But once you're in theatre. And you've got the patient, they come down, they've got them asleep, they're lying on the table. Actually, to put an X-Fix on with some SI screws really doesn't take that much more time than simply putting an X-Fix on. And actually, plating a synthesis doesn't take that long so, uh, compared with an X-Fix. So it's it's almost the getting to theatre that, that we, we've had the problem with, rather than once you're in theatre, taking an extra hour or so to do it absolutely properly. Uh, here's what happens if you do treat these non-op, 37-year-old male, this is a real patient, APC treated non-op 11 years ago during holiday in, in Greece, um, and what you're seeing here, quite simply, uh, if you see my mouse here, you see this like little gutter here, this is the monster hernia, and it is a monster, a monster hernia going right the way down to his knees, his entire ball bag on both sides, like extends down to his knees, and um, he has to wear this kind of like these massive spanks to kind of hold it all in. But as soon as he lets go, it all just pours down. It's terrible. And it's, it's you know, all of his genitalia are all like, uh, it's, it's hideous. And it's a difficult reconstructive option, of course. Vertical shear. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to dwell too long on vertical shear, but obviously these are unstable fractures. And uh, the inlet outlet gives us our pelvic ring displacement. You can see on the right hand view, you look at this outlet here. Uh, look at the tuberosity here. Look at the ischial tuberosity. You see how that's the bit you sit on. So there's there's one on the right. There's the one on the left. Look how high up it is. Look at the level of the hip joint on the left compared with the right. It's right up. This patient has got a leg length discrepancy of about two centimeters. Um, and on, on the inlet as well, you can see how wonky donkey it is. See that little step right there. That's where the left hemi pelvis is sheared right up. So. In pelvis, again, it's really about effective temporizing, good analgesia, effective traction, and all the rest of it, and tension to pressure areas, and VTE prophylaxis, of course, while you're waiting for this to happen. There is an argument about lightly tightened binders for comfort in an APC, let's say an APC2, you could put a binder on if you're waiting for three or four days, you could put a gentle binder on checking the soft tissues underneath uh, as a short term measure for comfort. Finally, acetabulum. <laughs> Lutonel, I'll give everyone 10 out of 10 if you can name every single one of those uh, classifications, but I'm not going to give you time to do that. I want you to think in acetabulum, because the fact is, in any of those scenarios, with that level of displacement you're seeing in that diagram, I would operate on those regardless, you know, and if you don't operate them, you will end up with osteoarthritis of the hip. I think it's important in acetabulum to work out what are the predictors of poor outcome. That's kind of the deal breaker here. And, and uh, there's a list of authors right there at the top. Um, and 
everyone's pretty much agreed that this line of, of, of things is this little, little list of description. This is the ones that give you a bad outcome. Displacement. The femoral head has moved inwards by a long way, by two centimeters, Matter says, but uh, a big displacement, uh, initial displacement, uh, always, always bodes poorly. Uh, impaction. Can you see the marginal impaction here? There's, there's, the, there's the normal side. There, there. Here's the posterior wall, but look at this. This is the marginal impaction right here, where you can see that the back of the acetabulum has been stoved in. Um, femoral head damage. Can you see this femoral head has been driven in? And look at the corner of the acetabulum has bored a, a divot, a bit like a Hill Sachs lesion, in the femoral head right there. This bodes really badly for the future. And notice the poor prognostic indicators are generally related to the injury. The surgery is more about, uh, the actual surgery is a relatively light pr prognosticator with one exception, which is reduction. So if you're going to go after an acetabular fracture, reduction is the key. And I've given an example here of dome impaction. I, I know we're talking about non-operative, but I, I'm making this point. to do, uh, This fracture right here has what's called dome impaction. You can see this is the edge of the acetabulum, which is intact. This is the bit that's stoved in. You can see the femoral head has kind of driven in medially. And if you're not able to push this back, stuff something behind it, stick some metal plates behind and, and get it all congruent again, that hip is absolutely doomed. Now you could argue using those criteria that the hip is gonna be doomed anyway. And so this is, uh, you know, you're doing something but it may not work anyhow and that is true. But the fact of the matter is that if you had left it, that patient gallops to total hip replacement incredibly quickly. So reduction is a thing. Uh, in acetabular surgery, it really is. And, you know, millimetric reduction is a thing, with one exception, which is older patients. Uh, so this is a 79-year-old lady who's fallen downstairs at home, associated rib fractures, bit of COPD, mild dementia. So she's really not in great situation. And you can see that left acetabulum is absolute toast. And the honest truth is, is fixing that surgically is very, very difficult. The only way to give this lady a great hip is to do a total hip replacement of some sort. It might be a fix and replace, or it might be just straight up replace with a cage. But uh, you, um, but you'll think, what about non-op? And you can treat that non-op. But the problem is, if you just sit her up in a chair and get her going, there is a danger that this will happen. That the, actually the, the the GT cracks off, and the femoral head medializes and ends up sitting right back on the ileum. And obviously not in that patient because she's got mild dementia, etc. But in, in as a, as a definitive treatment in someone who is feeling the pain and who is not demented, is good mental state and is potentially uh, active and fit, that is a really difficult reconstruction to do for the arthroplasty guys. There's this one though, and as my last case, this is a 69 year old guy who falls off a ladder. He's independent, he has a mind sub subarachnoid as he falls off. And what you can see here is an, what's called an ABC, an associated both column fracture. Look at the, it's, it's the right side that's fractured and look how it's been stuffed in. The head has gone in, but it's taken the whole of the acetabulum with it. So although there is an intraarticular fracture there, yes, it's all kind of arranged around the femoral head, so-called secondary congruency, yeah? The, the, the joint is broken, but it's still kind of wrapped around the femoral head. Look how displaced it is. That is more than two centimeters displaced. But nonetheless, that because the whole joint has moved together, there's your spur sign, yeah, of your of associated both column. There's the spur sign right there. That's that's it on the edge. The whole acetabulum has gone medially, and so actually, as long as it doesn't go completely medial like that previous lady, when this heals up, the patient, yes, they will have a shortened abductor arm and things, but actually, they will not necessarily go on to be demanding a total hip replacement in the next in the next year or two. So you often see these years down the line, having healed and, and actually having given a reasonable outcome. So this is a guy we saw just like last uh, um, two days ago, and we've treated him non-operatively, even though it's very displaced because he's got the secondary congruency. So that's my talk. Uh, in summary, Theatre constraint does modify your indications, it really does, and particularly in those minimally displaced ones where you're hedging one way or the other, uh, it does drive you towards more towards non-operative treatment. Um, the higher energy you go, the fewer options you've got for conservative management is my, is my feeling on this. There are no great conservative options when things, because not only have the bones gone, but all of the soft tissues have gone as well, and that creates huge instability. 
low energy PNA fractures do have quite a bit of non-op potential. Um, uh, and that's probably where people are drifting a bit like that guy I just showed you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. Um, I, what we'll do is um, we will come back to questions. We'll go to Alex now. I really want to hear what Alex has to say. And then we'll take some and then we'll have a, ch uh, a chat and a roundup at the end. Thanks, guys. Uh, well, thanks for having me along. I'm going to keep it a little more simple and stick to just the humble leg bone, none of this uh, acetabulum and pelvis uh, complexity. So I'm going to try and just touch upon a little bit about what the guidelines say. Um, and there's been a couple of questions already, actually, we'll come to around um, the issue of litigation later down the line with all of this non-operative management. A little bit about what we can't accept much like Pete pointed towards with the high energy stuff. I'll touch upon a little bit of the literature and we'll, we'll discuss as well the key thing for the lower limb about weight bearing and rehab, um, which I think is really important. So um, we'll take a couple from the top, a couple from the middle and a couple from the bottom and uh, have a look at this uh, in turn. But before we do, we'll, we'll talk about this, the, the, the guidelines that have come out. I, my disclosure is I sit on the BOA Trauma Committee, so I help write these guidelines that came out. I'm sure many of you will have seen them. But one of the key things we've, we've touched upon and someone asked the question already is what about litigation? And the guidelines were written with that in mind. People are gonna be very nervous about suddenly treating cohorts of patients and fractures differently to the way they normally do, different to what the accepted body of reasonable orthopedic surgeons would do at this time. So what's gonna happen in a year's time with that uh, you know, wonky malunion or that horrible non-union uh, where people have forgotten all of this drama and suddenly the patient's going, hang on, I was neglected. So the BOA does support reasoned pragmatic decision-making and acknowledges non-operative management at times is gonna be key um, and, and required. What it also suggests is that some of these changes, as we've heard about, need to not only be a, a, there to deal with our impact on resource, but also reducing the patient's risk to disease. So that conversation you have with the patient about decision making for their fracture needs to now uh, include a discussion on whether they feel they want to expose themselves to the risks of coming into hospital, having an aerosol generating procedure, having an anaesthetic, having time on a ward and so on. And that's really important. And Bringing all of that together, the thing that's going to get you, um, keep the BOA sort of supporting you and keep the BOA having your back is about documentation and consent. We've got to record everything that we do that might not be normal in this instance or every decision that we take that has been uh, made in light of the COVID crisis. So it's really important that we write that and, and the BOA has made a suggestion about what that might, um, those statements may contain. So I'm, I'm going to go through uh, some of my thinking and my distillates around um, the top, the middle and the bottom of the tibia. This is not comprehensive. This is not um, seminal because we don't manage many of these non-operatively anymore. There are a few things we do. There are a few trials that have come out with, with the ankle stuff. But by and large, we fix this stuff. The, the young adult, the high energy with the plateau, I think, you know, like Pete said with the femur, we, we, we're going to end up fixing these. These are, these are grossly unstable. They often come combined with uh, multiple injuries, with um, uh, bad soft tissues, compartment syndromes, vascular injuries, similar. You, you know, you're really going to struggle to get any sort of meaningful result from this sort of injury if you manage it non-operatively. Similarly, um, the elderly, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, when you see the top of the tibia disintegrating like this, this is a tibial plateau fracture. You can treat it non-operatively. You can put an 85 year old in a long leg cast for four months, but she'll probably be dead by the end of that. And we, we know from our work on frailty fractures that actually early mobilization is gonna be better for her overall. And the risks to her health managing this non-operatively are probably even greater than the risks of exposing her to anesthetic during the COVID crisis. So a, a hinged knee or something like that for this knee is totally reasonable. But what about the, the, the ones that are, are less sort of cut and dry? So here we've got this, um, and these are all, all my cases from, from over the last uh, couple of years, 40 year old male cycling. This is an isolated closed injury, no curve balls at all, compartment soft, everything's fitting well. So how are we gonna make that judgment 
when we look at the CT and we can see the depression, we can see that the uh, lateral wall has been a little bit blown out, a little bit um, widened, but not dramatically. How are we going to make that judgment call about whether we can avoid an operation? And if we are going to avoid an operation, how are we going to keep control of this situation such that the result isn't a, a poor outcome? And, and the absolute key here is the examination and the clinical examination, and they don't need to be asleep. And it's, it's a very straightforward examination. We do varus valgus stressing in the clinic all the time. People worry that it's going to be sore, but a bit like with weight bearing views in the ankle, we tell the patient, look, you know, give me 10 seconds of it being a bit uncomfortable, and I can tell you whether or not you're going to need an operation. And a gentle valgus stress compared to the other side, you're not going to give it a big, big waz over to one side and crush the bones more, but you're feeling, does the joint drop into valgus through the depression? And if there is virtually no valgus, and you've got to check it in extension and about 30, 40 degrees of flexion, if there is genuinely no valgus, this is totally fine to manage non-operatively. Don't look at the scan and think, crumbs, there's two mil of depression here, I've got to get in there. Because I'll put, flip it on its head. When you go to the operating theatre with a plateau, how do you decide how much elevation you need? How do you decide when is enough enough before I go for that one more tap and then end up crushing it all to bits? And the answer is you're looking for what we call height stability. So have you got the joint up enough that they don't get varus or valgus instability through the joint? Well, if you got the fracture to this position on the table and it didn't go into valgus through the joint, at that point, you'd say, do you know what? That might be as good as I can get it today. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. I'm gonna walk away from the table and they'll be fine. Don't forget on the lateral side of the knee, we've got a big meniscus covering this. And so the key things here are the valgus instability. And if you've got reasonable condylar geometry, you're likely to be able to manage this without an operation. I put them in a hinge knee brace not because I'm worried about um, controlling valgus per se, but they lose a bit of proprioception with the big hemarthrosis. Um, it's a visual reminder to the knee, um, uh, to them about their knee to sort of come off games and take it easy. But I'll let them weight bear or at least partially weight bear through this. Most people will be bearing weight through the center or to the medial side of the knee. And if you look, the medial half of the lateral joint just here, is actually in the right place. So a large portion percentage of their weight bearing surface is still in the right place. Here's a slightly different one, but again, not wholly dissimilar. This is a, a slightly more, um, a, a rarer fracture pattern, but 56 year old, he's got some you know, dodgy chest, he fell off a ladder. He's a bit swollen and he's got a little bit of tingling in his common perineal uh, distribution, but motor wise is okay. And, and you can't really see a lot on the x-rays. There might be a little bit of something going on at the back. But when you look at this, he's basically sheared off most of the back of his tibial plateau. Um, and it's really just a very subtle rim fracture. And this is probably representing uh, a ligamentous knee injury. Um, and so when you EUA him, he's, he's unstable. He's very unstable in flexion. But actually, in extension, he's totally stable. So here, what we can do is we can take a brace and we can block terminal flexion for uh, you know, six weeks. So we put him at a naught to 45 for six weeks. And what happens is that posterior rim heals and he doesn't then engage in the posterior deflex in flexion and have flexion instability when we come out of our bracing protocol. And the same can be done for the fractures that take a more anterior dink and you can block terminal extension for three, four, five, six weeks and prevent them engaging with the defects. So you can use your brace to help control the stability in the joint, not to prevent ligamentous instability, to, but to prevent bony instability. And, and, you know, I'm not joking. This is today's case. I did this girl today. She came in, she was absolutely plastered, driving her car back from a COVID party, a bottle of vodka found in the footwell, and she plowed into a tree last night. Uh, got triaged to a local hospital, then transferred to us. She's quite sick. You know, ribs. She's got a left hip fracture dislocation. We reduced. We spent about two hours doing her multifocal femur. We did her ulna as well, so we can get her up on crutches. She might have a scaphoid. She had a degloving that we dealt with, and she had this plateau as well. And I was thinking, oh, you know, we're going to fix this as well, and I can get her going. And I looked at the CT, and it's not the best CT. And I was thinking, crumbs. We've got to fix this. I e weighed her on the table, and it was rock solid. 
rock solid, not budging anywhere. Her lactate's still up a little bit. We've reduced the hip and she's gonna come back and have her acetabulum fixed in about five days time when she's better. And, and actually, she's not gonna be weight bearing on that side because of her acetabulum. And, and I don't think there's gonna be a lot of mileage in exposing her to another incision and another risk of, of um, wound infection if she's stable. So at the moment, we're gonna manage this one non-operatively. So when we look at the plateau, these are the sort of historical things that people get excited about. Axis stability, restoring motion, bony union, not getting an infection and restoring the joint, getting perfect articular reconstruction. The key things for me when you look at this are that actually the number of non-unions in a plateau you ever see is very low. Infection is a, a surgical insult usually leads to that. So that's about you understanding how to handle tissue properly and place incisions properly. Um, and yeah, there is a natural infection rate that occurs with fractures, but, but actually we're, we're, we don't see huge amounts of plateau infection. And articular reconstruction actually turns out to not be that important. And when you go back in the history and you look at some of the original literature on the big early series, the key thing that leads to a bad outcome is instability and malalignment. Um, and if you're gonna pick any way to conceptualize an articular fracture in the lower limb, a square joint fracture of the lower limb, so the distal femur, the proximal tibia, or the distal tibia, you've got to think in columns and you've got to think, how am I gonna control the columns at the level of the joint and in the level of the metadiaphysis? And you need stability around the circumference in all of those columns. The plateau, we've got the medial, lateral and posterior, and, and actually you need to have control in all of those columns. And if you've got control, you've got a stable fixate, a stable construct. And it doesn't mean that you have to have an operation to get control. So that's what we're doing when we're assessing these and when we're examining them and we're working out where in that circle we've got any instability. Do I need an operation or can a brace control that? So actually it's, axis and stability that are the really the only things to focus on in, in these sort of fractures or the main thing. And here you can see we didn't or this person didn't have stability and alignment in the metadiaphysis for their plateau fracture and they've developed a significant malunion. And when you go back and look at the literature again, historically non-operative treatment and operative in some series actually when they get good alignment, not bad, not dissimilar results. So my take home points for the plateau EUA for stability, selective stability with bracing, the metadiaphyseal alignment is key for, for a good outcome. The high energy and the serious ones need, need an operation almost uh, always, and when the elderly or the frailty ones, non-operative is going to be really hard to, to manage. So what about the shaft? So when we look at the shaft, again, we go back to high energy. You're not gonna treat the guy on the, on the left of your screen, that, that X-ray with an exploded tibia. That's gonna be virtually impossible to manage without an operation. The guy on the right with a significant open wound, again, we're gonna be operating on those. But if we go back and we look at that historic literature, you know, the name that comes up when we look at Plateau is Sarmiento's work. The guy described and, you know, a beautiful series of non-operatively managed um, uh, shafts but when you when you go away and you look at this paper and you really start to pick it apart this is massively technique dependent firstly they spent a week in hospital in a long leg cast before he went ahead and put them in their their cast uh, proper then the cast proper was put on under gravitational traction it was using stocking it and not just plaster in multiple and uh, not just uh, no wool um, and plaster in multiple layers. And then the contouring and the shaping of the cast at the top around the distal femur and over the patella tendon is extremely complex. And you've got to read those paragraphs in his paper three or four times to really get a feel for actually what he did. And I'm not sure that we have these skills in this day and age to do this as well as we think. And the other thing is when you go and look at his literature and he reported brilliant outcomes in everyone, yeah, they all joined up. But he said up to 10 degrees of coronal and sagittal plane malalignment is acceptable. I'm not sure 10 degrees is acceptable anymore uh, to our modern day patients. And when you look at this, this car, tibia was managed in a cast. It looks pretty good, but look, she's 40 and she's got a pretty shot medial compartment already. And actually when you measure her and stand her up, she's about seven or eight degrees of varus. She's loading through the medial side of the joint. She's unhappy and she gets a corrective osteotomy. 
So what are the bear traps then when we're going to manage a tibia in a cast? Because, you know, you stick it in a cast, it'll probably join up. So one of the key things here is about rotation. 55 year old, this lady, you know, a little bit large, has a simple innocuous fall and gets a, a tibial fracture. She gets a cast, it heals. But she comes to clinic, she is miserable as sin because now her foot is pointing out at 40, 50 odd degrees to the outside. She can't function. She's got knee and hip pain as a result. When you walk, if you've got an external rotation deformity, you always bring your feet to point forward. So when you're walking, and that means your knees turn in when you walk and your hip turns in and you get knee pain and hip pain and they have big problems. So she ends up getting a derotation osteotomy. You can see when you've got a lateral of the ankle here, you've got an oblique of the knee and actually she's massively rotated. So she gets an oblique, uh, she gets a derotation osteotomy and she's much happier. What about this sort of problem? So here we've got a lateral, it's a tibia, it's been treated in a plaster cast. It looks fine, it looks good from the lateral, but on the AP, we've got now a really complex deformity. We've got some translation, we've got some angulation. You know, these are things that you need to be able to overcome in a plaster cast if you're gonna manage it non-operatively. And actually, when you stand him up as well, we've got a significant amount of shortening. So now we've got three components of deformity we weren't able to control in a uh, plaster that leads to a predictably poor outcome. It may be that we discuss this with the patient and say, you may come to me in a year's time in this situation when hopefully we don't have COVID and accept that you want an osteotomy and a correction, or we could nail your tibia now, but you know the patient needs to decide. Here we go, deformed, short, tilted pelvis um, and, and a tilted joint line and they get a correction and actually uh, look a lot better. Still slightly translated medially, but overall much happier. And then the weird and wonderful things can happen. Sometimes everything looks hunky-dory on the lateral, but the tibia is joined up to a whole new bone. So what are we going to do here? So this is a really tricky situation. We've got a combination of malunion and non-union, and this would require quite you know, significant reconstructive surgery. So for the take home points for the shaft, casting's pretty straightforward and actually non-union isn't a particularly common thing with non-operatively managed tibia, but malunion is pretty tricky uh, to prevent. And you've got to be really aware of the fact you may end up with single uh, or multi-planar deformity. So in more than one direction and multi-level deformity and, and rotation is absolutely key as well. And you've got to think, when you look at the fracture pattern, how can you prevent that shortening? So we'll finish with just quick run through the ankle and the, and the plat on the bottom of the tibia. Um, again, this is a case from last week, another one at uh, uh, some sort of party during COVID, slipped on her heels. She comes to hospital about a day after the injury. It's closed, it's isolated. You know, this girl's big, she's a smoker. She's probably got early COPD. That's a, a sitting duck for getting in hospital COVID. She gets an initial cast in the ED, it's, plant, it's plantar flexed, it's not particularly uh, pretty, but actually we put her into a re, redone back slab, get her, get her swelling uh, down at home with three or four days elevation, and she's gonna be managed with con total contact casting non-operatively um, because she's got a reduced aligned ankle that we can control. We may not agree with this in, in normal times, but actually during this crisis, this is an entirely reasonable way to manage an ankle fracture. And I think when the patient has other risk factors for other problems, this is probably gonna be something we need to consider more. We're used to elderly ankle fractures uh, being, being told that we can manage these non-operatively. There's trials ongoing about the non-operative management of young adult ankle fractures, unstable ones, and perhaps now's a good time to start <laughs> recruiting to the, these trials. Unfortunately, most research is currently suspended. So, so ankle's fairly straightforward. The plafond is a little trickier. Um, much like the plateau, the, the soft tissues are often key. Um, major articular reconstruction in the plafond um, and not really reconstruction of the joint perfect per se but but distal tibial geometry is often required and and again we come to the issue of metadiaphyseal instability and malalignment so the question is if we're going to stage management in the classic st style of, of plaf uh, plafond um, can we actually discharge them in the interim so should we be doing that 10 days of elevation in an x-fix at home and then bring them back for the next stage. That's one thing to consider. Or even further than that is, can we do a stage one that we can then safely stop at and say, 
if this is where we get to with you, are you going to have a reasonable outcome? And that goes back to that pink box that Cash talked about at the beginning. And is there anything in the elderly we can do that gives them a single hit operation that's soft tissue friendly, that doesn't expose them to great undue risk and gets them up and about quickly? So maybe I don't to start with, but this is this is a you know your classic sort of uh, frailty type peel on in a in a smoking sixty five year old, and she just goes to theatre and someone does this. It looks okay initially, but this is never going to control the deformity in that ankle. And so now we've exposed them to an operation that isn't going to give a good outcome. So we've got to avoid this sort of thing. <coughs> uh, we, we, we can come to the, the sort of, can we park them in a safe place discussion? So here we go. This is a polytrauma from about five years ago that I looked after. This guy jumped off a, a, a height. He had a, a, a long list of pretty nasty injuries. He was properly sick. Um, we got him to theatre on day one for a plethora of X fixes for the lower limbs and, and a laparotomy and his aorta to be done. Uh, but everything was basically damage control. But the key thing is in damage control or in soft tissue control is if you take two more minutes and put on a pretty good X fix that's stable, you're respectful with the pins, you, you, you pre-drill them, you cool them, you put them in. It doesn't take more than another 30 seconds to pre-drill the tin pins in the tibia and you get a good alignment with your X fix actually things can be a pretty stable situation. This guy had a previous ankle fracture, so that wasn't, that wasn't my doing, but the X fixes we put on, we stuck a couple of vacs on, and this guy ended up spending three months on ICU and wasn't fit enough to ever go back to theater for his legs. He got his femur and his pelvis fixed, but he never really passed the tick for going back to theater for his pelons. And I managed him the whole time, we tweaked the, the right one slightly, but we managed it the whole time with just minimalist intervention, a tweak, a couple of percutaneous screws and a change of the sucker. It's not ideal, it's not brilliant, but this is a life-threatening situation. And actually both of these have gone on to heal with a reasonable outcome. You know, they're aligned, they're stable, he's got normal distal tibial geometry and he came to my clinic two years later walking in. So parking them safely where you can come back if you're able to, but if you can't, they are gonna end up with a reasonable result is worth considering. So when you do an X fix, you've really got to think about how are you gonna build it? How is it gonna stay solid and stable for six, eight, 10 weeks? And then finally, in the last case is what are we gonna do with, with these? These elderly diabetic vascular paths, rheumatoid arthritis, immunosuppressed poor skin. This guy's got the full house of lower leg disaster written all over it. If you make an incision in this skin, he's going to have trouble. You can't treat this in a plaster because he, he's going to get uh, ulcers. He's going to be in a plaster for about a year. You, you can be horrible to him and put a frame on the leg, um, but he'll chop up the skin on his other leg and he'll get neuropath. Neuropaths do um, badly in frames. They often you know, end up with very long frame times. They, they can cheese wire through. So, so what are we going to do here? And this is just something thinking outside the box of an alternative strategy. You can do a hind foot nail, but we can also do an anti-grade nail down into the talus. I think for me, the anti-grade is actually quite nice. You control alignment much better with the talus um, and you've got two lockers in the talus. You keep the subtalar free, which I think um, gives you a slightly more supple hind foot for them to walk on. And it's an immediate weight bearing construct. And this is their x-ray at three months. And then I never saw them again. So the take home points for the bottom end of the tibia, the ankle lends itself to, to a stable reduction and cast management in the main. Uh, there are certain patterns that maybe not, but by and large, we can manage them. The pylon is a trickier beast. And again, it comes back to stability and alignment. But actually the joint and worry about that later because the writing a bit like Pete said from the injury is on the wall with the peel on and the arthritis comes later. Final, final thing just to say about is about rehabilitation. We've talked a lot about who and what to operate on or what not to operate on. But, but how are you going to get them out of hospital early? How are you going to expedite discharge? And we've got to consider earlier weight bearing. It's a plea to the orthopedic community. I've written about this, but, but we've got to look at the way we manage Things. So you may need to adapt your fixation constructs from what you normally do to allow people to get up and move earlier or just be braver and say, do you know what? I'm going to let them walk. And I promise you nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, you're going to be OK. So there you go. That's what I tried to cover. I hope I've, I've given you a little bit of insight into the way I think about uh, things. Thank you very much.
so uh, I shall end my show. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. That's um, all right. I'd really love some of the conceptualization that you brought in there. And, and um, some of those principles are, uh, are really invaluable. So thanks. Listen, I know you mentioned it, but would you mind just getting on the Q&A, a question that's come up again um, is people are concerned that they may get sued post-pandemic. I know you touched on it, or you would, the BOA have tried to address it, but would you mind just speaking to that again, please? Yeah, sure. So I think it's a it's a really sort of rational and sensible concern, first and foremost. You know, we we get taught and we get examined in a way to manage patients and we have a accepted standards that we work to at all times. And all of a sudden we're in this situation where we've kind of torn all of that up and gone, do you know what? It's OK to go back in time 30 years or 50 years and it's OK to kind of willfully neglect some of these patients. What we have to remember is why that's come about. And what we have to remember is that there, there are groups of people around the, the country that have worked on the wording and the phraseology and the guidance that's come out to say it's OK to do this. From a medical legal standpoint, anyone who does medical legal will understand the terminology about a reasonable or responsible body of people. Um, and at this time, the responsible body has suddenly changed because the responsible body of people is now people are managing conditions differently to how they were two, three months ago. So actually, the key thing is going to be documentation. And anyone who isn't documenting their management decisions at the moment about how they're managing things or what they found is, is probably going to be in, in the bother. Um, and then just just having that open and honest conversation with the patient and saying, look, you know, we, we are living in a different era to what we were living in three or four months ago. Our decision making has to change. We are, we are a bit stretched, so we can't treat everybody with an operation we normally do. And do you really want to come into hospital and, and sit next to a, a ward with people who've probably got COVID, but we don't know it yet? Or doctors who are walking around between one COVID patient and you? So, so actually, when you talk to the patients reasonably, a lot of them go, do you know what, I'm out, thank you very much, and go, I'll chance it. And then you just need to explain to them, that we'll have to follow you up. You may come to needing surgery later on, but you know, so long as they understand that's the case, they're very unlikely to want to sue you. And I think you're right, that documentation is key. I, I, almost everything I, I, I've kind of written as an aside, due to the COVID-19, evolving COVID-19 pandemic, dot, dot, dot. And because people will forget about this in a few years, but potentially the dates of it, so uh, assume we're not still locked down. And so I think it's, documentation is key, as you say. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing just to say on that very briefly is it's not just your decision making in, in do you or don't you operate, but it's your decision making in clinics. So like we were talking about, you know, how, what's the burden on clinic? I, I'm writing, you know, had telephone consult, not face to face due to COVID. Yeah. And often you're saying to the patient, you know, come up to the hospital, have an x-ray and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a ring. And you just have to write that, that that was during this period and it's totally acceptable. Agreed, thank you. Um, one, another um, theme of questions, Pete, Olivia, if you can unmute your mics as well, is with the intention of trying to keep patients out of hospital, should we be increasing the threshold for getting a CT or reducing the frequency of check, follow-up check x-rays? That's something people really want to know. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I, I, I personally think CT is valuable if it's going to change your decision-making process. And likewise with an X-ray, you've got to think, why am I bothering? Why am I getting this X-ray? And, 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 and in the current climate, you've got to think, well, even one step beyond that, you've got to think, why is this patient coming to clinic? So at the Royal London, we've been vetting our own clinics to decide who is actually going to come to clinics. So, so, uh, so for example, my clinic tomorrow, I've split into three individuals that I'm going to re, uh, you know, we rung last week to say, you know, there is an international health emergency. You're not needed to come to hospital. We'll see you in three, four, five, six months, whenever. Um, this is um, possible to safely bring you back to hospital. Then there's a second group of patients that I've looked at their notes and their x-rays and I've decided, you know what, I can have a conversation with them on the phone and we can avoid a clinic consultation. And then there are a couple of patients that I will invite along because I want them to have an x-ray on a change of plaster or perhaps have a CT so that I can decide on management. But actually once you once you are really critical you're actually surprised how many people you can discharge um so 
I think x-rays and CTs are valuable only if it's going to change your management. Thank you. Pete, most pelvic fractures, virtually every, every pelvic fracture gets a CT traditionally. Yeah. Is that still the case for you? Yeah, it is, it is still the case. And that, that, that's still what we're doing. And the truth of the matter is, is, is that most, okay, leaving out tablet for pelvic ring, most pelvic ring injuries have a sufficiently high level of injury that they're actually, um, they're part of the trauma court anyway. And therefore the whole trauma team are all covered in PPE and therefore it's treated like, so, so CT is just part of that gig. Um, for falls from standing height though, for, for pubic ramus fractures uh, from a low energy, I don't think those have ever required CT. They often get it these days. But I don't think they need it. No, acetabulum is helpful if you're going to go operative. But if um, so, yeah, a, a CT is really helpful in in in, uh, in in acetabulum. You see, we're quite fortunate that we have an advanced um, trauma setup um, with our colleagues where we are, and we have CT right there. But if you're in another hospital where you may not be CTing people for their pelvis routinely. Would you then send one back for? Would you send someone back for a CT later if you saw a pelvic fracture? Uh, uh, no, I might. I might send them back for an X-ray out of binder, but but yeah. uh, no, usually usually not. No, I, I I I would say that in open forum. I'm very happy if if a low energy pelvic fracture uh, like a fall from a fall from standing height does not need a CT. And we, we all, they always get one, but you don't absolutely need one because you've got a puberamus fracture. It's an LC1. We know what it's going to look like on the CT. Or it's very unusual to be surprised by that. Uh, I think we over treat those anyway. And certainly at the moment, we shouldn't be seeing CT. And um, Alex, are you, Alex, are you still CTing all your plateau fractures? Uh, it, it depends on the, the fracture. I think the CT is useful um, to get your eye, head around the morphology. And as I was talking about, when you're bracing stuff, um, if you understand the geometry and the pattern of the fracture, the CT gives you a lot of help. The other thing is the natural uh, way that our processes work is almost all of them are going to get a CT as they as they come through the door. Um, so we're still getting a lot of trauma. I mean, the, all the trauma scans, uh, pan scanning everything. So you can't really stop that type of response. OK, it, because as I say, the, the question is, should we... If you see an x-ray with a minimally displaced or non-displaced fracture, one may traditionally CT that. In this current environment, would you consider not CTing it? Yeah, no, absolutely. So if you get the sort of the, the minimally displaced one that comes through the fracture clinic that's only had plain x-rays, I probably wouldn't CT it because I think my, you, you know, my ability to interpret the x-rays and the clinical examination together, I, I don't think the CT would add vast amounts of information. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Pete, would you like to sum up and just round things up for us? Sure thing. Uh, I, I, these, these are just ramblings from the, uh, from the talks. I've, I've, I've picked out people's things from people's talks. I hope, I hope you can see that. Am I, am I, am I, I'm on you. I'm good. Um, so right at the outset, uh, uh, Cash put up this slide. He said there are two scenarios. One is uh, a non-operative managed fracture and the other is a neglected fracture. And I would, I would say that is one of my take homes from the day is that if you're going to treat something non-operatively, it's not a passive, just like, okay, therefore we do nothing. Non-operative treatment is often an active thing. You're doing a thing. It just doesn't require a general anesthetic, but you're very much doing a thing. And also you're setting uh, a, a, a period of surveillance afterwards as your, as your follow-up. Um, I was going to take my example. Of this one, I, I, I should, this is one of the non-operative cases uh, that, we, that we put up uh, as, as as part of a discussion uh, before this webinar. So it's an intraarticular distal radius fracture. I will level you with you. This ended up getting fixed. So I'm not going to pretend this got treated non-op. What I wanted to challenge you with was: could it be treated non-op? It got manipulated. It got could it put in plaster? That's what it looked like. Now what are you going to do? Non-operative treatment isn't saying, fuck it, this looks fine, I'll see it in six weeks. That, that is neglect, that's not non-operative. What I would say, if I had to treat this non-operatively, and I'm not an upper limb surgeon, but if I had to treat this non-operatively, I would actually take that plaster off. I'd take him to the plaster room, maybe give him another uh, hematoma block or something. I would re-manipulate it. I would, you see on that, on the, on the lateral, you see that hitch there. It's still dorsally angulated. We know where that's going to end up if we leave it in this cast. I might even leave it a week before doing it. But 
it will now it might end up going exact doing exactly what Livio said and ending up back dorsally angulated exactly where it was. But non-operative treatment, I would counsel you, is an active process where you do a thing and then you do the very, very best you think you can for that fracture, and then you see what happens. And it may or may not work, but it definitely won't work if you just neglect it. Livio, very quick comment on that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, truth be told, the uh, you know uh, how we treat patients has been evolving week by week. And yes, it did, this did get uh, treated operatively at sort of uh, at the turn of how this when this pandemic became uh, sort of um, full blown, as it were. But yes, if you're going to treat this non-operatively, um, you would need to recast it and give it another attempt at trying to regain that length and it. it given that the articular surface is reasonably well maintained that it is not impossible to get a, a pretty reasonable outcome and worst case scenario if it collapses in that position um that he started off in you do a corrective osteotomy at a later date okay cheers mate a uh, couple of things uh uh, these are just my ramblings of this. High energy fractures are less likely to, to, to lend themselves to non operative treatment. You saw a few, a few of mine, you saw a great example in Alex's talk and in Livio's talk. High energy fractures, unless it's like proximal humus, which you know is going to pull out nicely, is probably not, they're, they're less amenable to it. Clinical examination. That came out of every single one of our, our talks. Um, uh, nice one, uh, Alex talking about varus valgus. Alex, just give me a very, uh, un unmute yourself quickly. You talked about an EUA. In these settings, is it okay for an EU no A? In other words, like doing, maybe put some local anesthetic into the knee and then examining their tibial plateau fracture. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I used the term EUA incorrectly. I mean an EUA in clinic or EUA in, on the ward. And, and that's what I do. I don't even necessarily inject local. I just tell them, you know, they've usually got a, a, a fairly big hematoma. You're not going to be varus valgusing to, to the point of agonizing pain. It's like doing when you tell the patient a weight bearing ankle. It's going to be a bit sore, but I'm going to have the answer for you. And most of them are, are perfectly amenable to it. Great. Lovely. Uh, Non-operative is an active process. I've bored on about that. Plateau, stability and alignment. It's actually, you get you get much more from a, the tibial plateau is a remarkably forgiving fracture provided you have stability and alignment. So if you can get those, you don't have to worry about little articular incongruities of five mil here and five mil there. We do like to, because it makes us feel good, but the, the plateau is a forgiving creature if you've got stability and alignment. Oh, that's come right in the middle of my thing. Uh, uh, tibial shaft malunion is poorly tolerated that was a great e example of that rotation angulation shortening they they are things that require osteotomy down the line and so we're uh, there's nothing like a tibial nail and indeed a femoral nail for just straightening out your tibia uh almost done cash uh there were some discussions about litigation, and I think a lot of this is about patients being involved in the decision. If you're if you're treating someone non-operatively, the patient has to be on board with that. Livio talked very nicely about how uh, um, you know dis uh, clinical examination and then discussion of, of expectations with the patient really helps clarify to them what they might end up with. And Alex was talking about that as well, about saying how you know. I'm, I'm treating you non-operatively here, and I hope this works out, but I'm warning you, you might need an osteotomy down the line. So when that happens, it's not a massive surprise. Uh, the ankle can be controlled in plaster. Traditionally, we, we've, we've been taught that it can't be, but we're, we, we think it maybe can be, and the FAME trial has been interrupted periodically, waiting for the answer on that. Excellent temporization is my final point. If you're going to do a temporizing operation, which is usually an X-fix, don't just slap on an X-fix, do a really nice X-fix. If you're gonna put someone in traction, make the traction good. A good X-fix is, is so much stronger than a lame one. And so a couple of extra pins, maybe make them HA coated, put the X-fix on, even though it's just a bog standard spanning X-fix, put it on with a view to it staying on for six weeks. You might take it off in a week's time if you've got theater space, but you might not. And if your X-Fix is the one that collapses and falls to pieces, you'll feel like an ass. Any other comments from the faculty? Those are my summary, summarizing points. No, not for me, that was great.
Brilliant. Uh, can you stop sharing? I've got one more thing to do and we're done. We're sure. 30 seconds away from finishing, guys. Mike, can you unshare me? What? Pete, I want you to stand up. What are you wearing? <laughs> I got trousers on. I got trousers on. <laughs> but it's a great question. So, um, guys, thank you very much. I'm really sorry about the, like, it's the first time we've ever done this. Uh, we had a slight hiccup with getting people in, but I mean, watching the YouTube link on the side here, we've had 80, 90 people throughout on YouTube. So I think we've had about 200 people all in. We'll get it sorted for next time so everyone can get in here. Apologies for that. Um, we've got um, some webinars coming up. We've got a, a really exciting one next week, which is basically talking about the impact of COVID-19 orthopedic training. What does it mean for you? What, how does it affect the number of WBAs you've got to do? Your ARCP and the outcome 10, what is it? About your rotations, what happens if you've, got, you've missed a course, ATLS, to, what if you've, you know, to help get you through an next ARCP? And what if you um, need to go on fellowship or you've got the exam? So we're gonna, we've got uh, Trish Campbell, who's the voter president. Rob Grug is the chair of the SAC. And Lisa Hadfield Law, who everyone knows. And so we're going to do that next Wednesday. And then, I mean, to be fair, what else are you going to do? You're stuck at home. You can't go to the pub. And then the week after that, we've got a tutorial following up from this one, almost the second part of this tutorial, which is what are we going to do after the pandemic? What are we going to do with these fractures that come in that we were not able to treat the way we would have done definitively at the time? And that may have gone on to a non-union, a malunion, an infection. What are we going to do with those? So that's going to be our follow-up webinar in a fortnight. Um, our aim is to try and run webinars fortnightly, but we just thought we'd get these ones out while we're here. And I hope you guys will come and join us. Thank you for bearing with us. And um, we'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks, guys.